Okay, let's start the class. In previous class, we have thought about the problem when we think about the Martin-Sittig transformation. The problem to understand the Martin-Sittig transformation is that the happy plane, which is the interface between the Martin site and Austinite is apparently it is a invariant plane, but its index is quite strange value, which is not the slip plane of the FCC. And the in the index of that heavy plane do not have an integer. And the second one is the orientation relationship between the Martin site and the Austinite. And usually the orientation relationship has very close one, which is called the Kuzumov Sox or Nishama Parsama. But the orientation relationship itself is not uh, exactly matches with that, which means that the orientation relationship is can be say can be said diffused. And the third one is that when you consider the velocity of the interface during the transformation, you can think that the velocity is sufficiently high to support the experimentally observed the kinetics of the martin sittig transformation. So for the interface to have those kind of high velocity, we, I, I talk to you that the characteristic of the interface should be semi-coherent interface, which, have, which has the glissile dislocation, one set of glissile dislocation, which means that the deformation which convert FCC to BCC, Austinite to Martensite, should be invariant line strain because that the interface, if the interface has one set of glissile dislocation that the deformation along with the dislocation line should not be observed, which means that the line along that, the direction along the dislocation line will be invariant line during the transformation. But microscopic, microscopically observed shape tell you that the deformation which convert austenite into martensite is invariant plane strain, right? So we have to handle this discrepancy to understand the martin sittig transformation. So in this class, I'd like to give you the explanation on the martin sittig transformation, which is called phenomenological theory of the martin sittig transformation. So in this class, I will give you the mechanism in letter descriptive way, qualitative way. But in later class, we will handle that theory in more uh, mathematical way. Let's start with thinking about how to change the FCC material into VCC structure. What kind of deformation will change this 
austenite into martensite. There are many ways to change, to deform the face centered cubing material into body centered cubing material. But the simplest way, simplest means that minimization of the movement of the atom during the change of the crystal structures. The way minimize the atomic movement during the change, <coughs> crystallographic change from FCC to BCC is called vein deformation, as I talked to you in previous class. Here, this is our parent austenite. And as you know, this austenite has best centered cubic structures. When you look at this unicell here, even though this is unicell of the face centered cubic, when you look at the unicell as this one, this is body centered tetragonal. Tetragonal means that these two axes is the same length, but the third axis has different lengths. That, that is the meaning of the tetragonal. So this unicellular is body center tetragonal. So it will be easy to understand that when you want to convert body center tetragonal into body center cubic, you have to compress along this axis and you have to stretch the lattice along this direction. So here is the initial structure of the BCT, which belongs to the body center of the cubic structures. And this is deformed BCT, which now it become a body center of the cubic. So the deformation which compressed along one axis and stretched along two axes will give you, will change the crystal structure from FCC structure to BCC structures. This will be the simplest way, simplest deformation which convert face center the cubic to body center the cubic. So in the matrix form of deformation, the vein strain can be presented with this matrix, eta1, and eta2 is eta1, is the same, and eta3. And it value depends on the ratio of the lattice parameter. The ratio of the lattice parameter of austenite and martensite will determine the matrix of this vein deformation. So, as I told you, the deformation which change face center the cubic in body center of the cubic should be invariant line strain, which permit the fast movement of the interface. So let's check whether the vein strain is invariant line strain or not. Here, let's assume our FCC, initial FCC has a spear. Then when you apply vein deformation to the, our initial FCC material, it changes the shape of spear into 
skewed spear, which means ablate. Right? So here, our initial FCC materials, and we apply the vein strain, that spear, that then it will stretch along these two axes and compress along the third axis. So the spear will be skewed shape after the deformation, right? At first, we have a spear, and we stretch that spear along two directions and compress along the third direction. Then the spear will have some oblate shape, right? So this is schematic diagram, which shows the shape of the FCC material before and after application of the bane strain. <clears throat> For the deformation with invariant line strain, we have to find, we can, we can find one line which is not affected by the deformation. So can you find any vectors which is not affected by the vein strain? Here is our FCC materials. This is initial. is arbitrary vector, A. Can you find any vectors on the FCC which is not affected by the vein strain? When we apply the vein strain on this FCC material, all the vector will change. There is no vectors which is not affected by the vein strain. So vein strain itself is not the invariant line strain. Right? Then let's think about these vectors C prime, D prime, or A prime, B prime, which is a vector on the deformed, on the deformed material, the vectors on the BCC. And let's assume that this A, B, or C, D is the vectors which is original vectors of A prime, D prime before the deformation. So let's assume that these vectors is deformed to these vectors by vein strain. Then you can understand the length of these vectors is not changes, but its direction is changed by vein deformation, right? This dotted line is the vectors after deformation, and this solid line is vector before deformation. So when you compare the lengths, the length itself is not affected by the deformation, but the vector is rotating. Right? The length 
is given by the radius of this pier. Right? So, even though the main deformation is not an uh, invariant line strain, you can find some set of vectors of which length is not affected by the deformation, but it rotate. So when we combine, when we combine vein deformation with rigid body rotation, which matches this C prime, D prime vectors to C, D. So we rotate the BCC along this axis, which means the rigid body rotation. We can match C prime, D prime to C, D vector. So I can say vein strain itself is not the invariant line strain. But when we combine the vein strain with rigid body rotation, it will give you one direction which is not affected by the combination of the deformation. So the lattice transformation matrix, lattice transformation deformation, is the combination of rigid but, uh, vein strain and rigid body rotation. The vein strain and rigid body rotation will change the FCC structures into BCC structures with one direction which is invariant line. Okay. So then what factor determine the rotation axis which matches the C prime D prime and C D vector? What is the most important factors which determine the rotation angle. Naturally, it comes from how, how much we compress and how much we stretch the lattice, right? So when we compress the lattice quite a lot, then we have to rotate a lot, right? So then what determines the degree of com compression? Hmm? Sorry? <laughs> which determine the degree of compression, the ratio of the lattice parameter. So this value will determine the degree of the rotation, right?
So the ratio of the rectus parameter between FCC and BCC determine the rotation angles. It depends on the alloy system because there are many alloy systems where we can observe the martensite transformation. But the lattice parameter of the austenite and lattice parameter of the martensite varies, will vary depending on the alloy system. Right? So that is one of the reasons why we observe some diffuse orientation relationship between martensite and austenite. Because basically the orientation relationship is determined by bane deformation and wrist body rotation. But the rotation angle depends on the alloy system. So it does not have a unique orientation relationship and it has diffuse relationship depending on the alloy system. When you look at this PCT and the FCC unicell, you can understand that the PCC structures and FCC PCC unicell and FCC unicell has perfect orientation relationship, which is described by Kruzmov Sachs. But the vein deformation and the rigid body rotation deviate the orientation relationship from strict orientation relationship. And the de degree of deviation depends on the ratio of the lattice parameter. And that's why we observe diffuse orientation relationship depending on the alloy system, right? <clears throat> so now we understand that the Lattice transformation deformation, which can convert FCC crystal structure to BCC crystal structure with invariant line deformation, is the combination of bane strain and rigid body rotation. But still, we have problem. The combination of the bane strain and rigid body rotation is invariant line strain. But the observed shape of the martensite is what? Observed shape is Like this, observed shape is invariant plane strain, which has a heavy plane, right? So how can we handle this discrepancy? So this diagram not exactly describe the transformation, but it will be very helpful to understand. When we apply the bane strain and rigid body rotation, we can convert austenite into the martensite with invariant line strain. Here, let's see the invariant line is the line along this perpendicular direction to the screen. Definitely can convert FCC to BCC. But observed shape. You can, <clears throat> what you observe when you look at the martensite, this 
is the observed shape. Invariant plane strain. Here, the invariant plane is plane along this. So, now we have the martensite crystal structures, but that the shape of martensite is not observed experiment. Experimentally observed one is here. So how we can match this martensite structures, this shape of martensite structure with this shape, into this shape, without changing the crystal structures. The crystal structure is already martensite, but the shape is not the one which can be observed. So we have to change. We have to convert the shape of martensite into what you can observe experimentally. So what kind of process will change the shape without changing the crystal structure? There are two kind of there, there will be two kind of process which can change the shape of the crystal without altering the crystal structure itself. One is slip and the other is twinning. So by introducing the slip along this plane or twinning, you can match the Barton side, which is not observed experimentally, into the Martin side, which has a proper shape experimentally observed. We call this <coughs> deformation to match the shape of the Martin side as lattice invariant shear. So by considering the lattice invariant shear, now finally we can obtain the Martin site with proper crystal structures and proper shape, which is experimentally observed. So now if you look at this one, you have an answer why the heavy plane has an irrational index. Microscopically observed heavy plane is just trace of this boundary and this boundary. And boundary of twinned region and boundary of slip region. So that Heavy plane do not necessarily have any integer value because microscopically this seems to be a slip plane, but when you look at when you look at this figure, this is nothing more than the boundary of the slipped and twinned region. So by this way, the theory of the Martin side transformation will give you all the answer which raised in the previous class. The heavy plane, the problem of heavy plane, the problem of the orientation relationship, and the retist, uh, the invariant line strain and invariant plane strain. The retis, uh, the retis transformation strain should be invariant line, but observed one is invariant plane strain. So this diagram will 
give you the answer on the difficulty to understand the Martin side transformation. As I told you in previous class, the theory, phenomenological theory of Martin Seelig transformation was developed in 1950s, mathematically completed. But the ob observation of the Martin side itself with the transmission electron microscope was done in later time. Here, this is the martensite, and this is the austenite. And as the theory predicted, you can see very fine twins inside of the martensite plate. And you can see that the heavy plane, which is index 31510, not 31510, close to 31510, <coughs> is a mirror, the boundary of the twin re region. Okay? When you consider the Martin static transformation from the FCC to B BCC material, we have to consider the role of the lattice invariant shear. But there is a, some special case where you do not need to consider about the role of the lattice invariant shear. That is the formation of the epsilon Martin site. As you know, the epsilon Martin site and phase center, uh, epsilon, uh, epsilon Martin site has HCP structures. And the austenite has FCC structures. Both of the structures are closed packed structures. The difference between them is stacking sequence, right? When you look at Face center the cubic and stacking sequence along one unknown -on direction will be ABC, ABC. Right? There is When you count from this position, A, B, C, A. So A, B, C, A, B, C. But when you think about the stacking sequence of closed packed plane of the HCP material, that will be A, B, A. So just changing the stacking sequence itself is enough to convert FCC austenite into HCP martensite. So how the stacking sequence can be changed? Here, the stacking of A, B, C, A, B, C, which is stacking along the one on one direction of the FCC materials. So with this as a starting crystal structures, when we put one partial this location on one on one plane, it will change the stacking sequence C into 
staking on A position. Right? Now, with introduce of introducing of one partial dislocation, the staking of FCC will change A, B, A, B. Right? This will be clear when you think about the position can where atom can sit on. This, this is one on one layer of the FCC and the second choice, the choice of the atom on the second layer can be this position or this position. So when the second layer sit on, on this red position, then the third one will sit on this blue one. So the role of the partial dislocation is move the layer with this blue one into original position A. So this slash illustrate the movement of that the third layer. So the stacking sequence of A, B, C, A will change A, B, A, B. So the passage of the partial dislocation will change the crystal structures. Like this one. Here, this part is the our parent austenite. And when the partial dislocation move every other one on one plane, it will change this ABC, ABC stacking sequence to AC, AC, AC. And this interface, this line will give you microscopic interface between the austenite and the epsilon martensite. <laughs> so when you think about the epsilon martensite formation from the austenite, we do not have, we do not It is not necessary to think about the role of reticence invariant shear because the observed invariant plane is a slip plane. So this austenite can be converted into the martensite with the slip along this invariant plane. So in this case, the heavy plane, the index of heavy plane has a rational value, which is a slip plane of austenite here, the 111. Okay. When you think about the reticence transformation, deformation with the vein and wrist body rotation, then in this case, the vein deformation itself is a stretch along one axis 
and what axis leaves without change and compress along the third axis. See, please see the difference between this one with this one. The vein strain during the uh, transformation of the austenite into BCC martensite, we have to stretch in both sides, but the transformation from the FCC to HCP martensite, one axis leaves unchanged. And when we combine this band strain with the raised body rotation, this line is invariant line, and also we have already have one invariant line. So we have two invariant line, which consist invariant plane. If we have two invariant line, the plane which, con con which contain these two vectors will be invariant plane. People think that the transformation from the austenite to HSP martensite, both of the crystal structures is close packed one. So people are likely to think of that there is no density change. But actually that is not the case. Here is the dilatation curve of these two alloy system. One is 0.1 carbon and 11 manganese, and 1 point carbon, 1 point one, uh, 0 0.1 carbon, and 13 mangan. Here, when we heat up the specimen into the austenite, transform, uh, austenite temperatures and cool down, cool down, here is the cooling curve. And some characteristic change occurs at these temperatures. One line increase and one line slightly decrease. This 11 manganese steers, the transformation product is BCC martensite. And 13 manganese steer, the transformation product, product is epsilon martensite. So when you think about the transformation from FCC to BCC, it is natural that we have, a, we can observe the increase of the length because during the martensite transformation, the volume of the material will increase. Right? But when you look at this curve, Carefully observation will say you this curve is slightly go down. So it indicates that <coughs> even though the austenite to epsilon martensite transformation is transformation between two closed packed crystal structures, but there is a change in density, which comes from the difference in the lattice parameter. So you have to remember, even though epsilon martensite formation from the austenite, both of crystal structure is cross packed one, but there is a volume change. Even though the volume change is quite small compared to the FCC to BCC martensite transformation. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
using this character, we can distinguish the stacking fault and epsilon Martin site in the transmission electron microscope. When we observe the stacking fault, In the transmission electron microscope, here this is stacking fault, and this is this is bounding dislocation. Here is stacking stacking fault. So the stacking fault can be seen or cannot be seen depending on the diffraction condition. So that's why one that that is one of the method to index the stacking fault. So when we use this deflection beam, you can observe this stacking fault. And when you look, uh, observe the microstructure with this, this, this deflection beam, this stacking fault cannot be seen. But when we observe the epsilon Martin site, which has very similar structures with the stacking fault, then even in the condition where the epsilon Martin site cannot be seen, there is slight, slightly different image appear. This image come from the difference in the volume. So that is one of the methods to distinguish the stacking fault and the epsilon Martin site in the transmission electron microscope. Okay, this is the final slide I prepared. Any question? No? Okay, then see you in next Tuesday. <laughs>